follow up on that, Adam. Like, what is the messaging in, in that moment to, to your group about handling emotions? And even for you, like you're dealing with emotions, I'm sure yourself. So I guess how do you go about like handling that, dealing with that? You know, I, you don't, we're not robots. So you can't compartmentalize. Okay, now it's this, let me go into this mode. I think you're trained through it by just how you live your life, you know, and the ups and downs of it all. and. You know, I hate to say you have a job to do because this is still a game for these guys. And, you know, as as high of a level that we play and coach at, you know, you just want to be able to get back to who you are. And uh, that comes down after you get a strip sack fumble. Uh, and that happens when you lose one of your leaders or when you go down in a game that you're hardly favored. You know, and I think you just, you train for that daily, you know, and um, we live in, you know, away in this you know at this level of football and this level of entertainment that you know there's going to be negativity there's going to be high positivity and you got to try to live in both of those worlds and still operate the same uh, which is just a mind on the next step and trying to be better and um, easier said than done but that's how we train every day and so you're kind of built for those moments uh, even though you're not prepared for everything that comes you're prepared how to react to it all Awesome. You mentioned the strip sack fumble. Um, was that just something that you guys just needed on the sideline just to um, turn things around a little bit? Or how much did that help on the sideline? Yeah, I mean, we called strip sack fumble blitz. And, uh, <laughs> it was great that we executed. We saved them. There's only a certain number that happened. Um, some just happened, but most of them we just call that way. You know, the Clemson one, this right. way. It's just how we operate. Um, but, you know, it was. You know, sometimes in those games, when you're playing those games, you know, those third downs are pretty um, interesting. You want to kind of, you know, you want to attack, you want to be smart, you want to kind of see how the game's going to play out sometimes. Um, and then, you know, sometimes you just know plays need to be made and you just make sure you put your guys in the best position. But then they got to go out and do it. And, um, you know, there was actually a screen set up. And they, they had a screen set and our guys did a good job of covering it so it will it gave you know J Dub the ability to get there a little bit um, longer extended play, but he made the most of it. Anytime you can get a sack, create the takeaway, but also get on the ball, that was a big time play by him. Aslan, coach, I think you kind of have like a, a unique perspective on this. You know, being a defensive coach and, and seeing what happened to Jordan, you know, I guess some people characterize that tackle as one of those hip drop tackles, and that's something that's been talked about in a lot of football circles as being a play that should be outlawed or looked at. And, being a guy that's coaching defense and trying to get guys onto the onto the field, obviously to, to tackle them. I mean, what are your thoughts on that that play specifically, um, and how do you guys go about? Like, we don't see you, I don't think, coaching that play. But how do you guys go about? Yeah, I don't know if we've had that situation here on our side of the ball in the four years I've been here. You know, I'm all for making this is the greatest game in the world um, because of the physicality of it, because of the response necessary, because of the amount of people on the field, the speed that it's played. But I'm all for making the game as safe as possible. Um, no coach, no player wants to see injuries happen during a game. And how do we keep the integrity of this great game of the physicality, the speed, but also make it safe? And I've been kind of aligned to the party of, you know, I want to be forward thinking in how we can do that. Um, because no matter what rules you play, there's still going to be physicality in this football game. It's about moving people back and forth, the space created, the space taken away. And, um, you know, I don't have all the answers to, you know, to how you, you know, fix all the injuries, um, but I am a big advocate of making this game as safe as it, as it can be, um, you know, within reason of how you do the rules. Corey? So you're all set up to play a guy that had started a million games, and now you're playing a guy that I think I just looked it up, has thrown eight passes in his college career, uh, run 12 times, or vice versa. So he's been on the field very few times. How do you go about game planning for him? Do you go back to like his huddle film from high school? Do you have, do you, would you even think to do that? Or is it more about game planning for the Florida offense? And do you expect it to change now that they've got, I guess, probably a more athletic guy behind center? Uh, yes, very, very much so. Um, you know, the third and three keeper for 20 plus yards got my attention really quick. Um, but when you're, when you're a, a backup quarterback, say, at this level, I mean, you've got skill set. Um, maybe sometimes you just need an opportunity, right? Um, sometimes coaches, 
um, play to the guys they think are best, but sometimes it takes an injury or sometimes it takes um, somebody not playing well for that person to get the opportunity. And you really know, don't know how they're going to respond. We will go back and we've done that. We'll look back at transfers previous schools. We'll look at redshirt freshmen. We'll look at their high school film because the traits of the player are still the traits of the player. Now, how they perform those traits within the scheme, within the environment that put in, like that's the uncalculated you know, thing that you got to kind of measure. Um, but these guys have had a lot of success running the football. They got two really talented receivers. Um, you know, their head coach is the play caller. So he's been doing it for a number of years. So you take all that into account of how much will change. Um, and that's all part of just game planning for this week. Kurt. I know he's, uh, he's not on your side of the ball, but you probably have a unique perspective going up against Tate in practice the last three years. I'm just curious, I guess, for your impression of how far he's come and just the progress he's made, really, it's been more obviously on the practice field than, than on in games. Yeah, I mean, Tate's a valuable member of our team, and uh, he's always been one of the better athletes. You know, you, you see him just playing catch, running around, he's on our hands team. You know, outside of the quarterback play, I mean, he's as athletic, and he's got good speed, long, got good hands. Um, but I will tell you this, when his number's been called, he's been prepared. And whether that was in the backup role the last couple of years, you know, and when he's got the opportunity, he's gone in there and he's done the job. We have all the confidence in the world to take. Sorry. Coach Norvell was talking about Florida's receivers, and obviously the Pierce Hall had a really nice game last year. Uh, here. Um, Bernardo didn't look like he was available later in that game. How's that group looking? And, and if you could also talk about Azari and how he's played the last month or so. Yeah, I really feel like we've had three starting corners throughout the year. Um, obviously, Fentrell and Bernardo have been starting the majority, but there's been games where AZ has got more playing time than the others. Um, so, you know, just guys go down and other guys step up. Um, you know, having the ability to have J Dub have been, been playing nickel and corner. Uh, Greedy's given us valuable time. Um, we've used Kevin Knowles in there at nickel, which allows us to move some guys out. So, this is why you build that depth, you know, and you never, you know, hopefully everybody's available. Um, we'll plan for that to be accordingly with Renardo. Um, but if not, or if somebody else goes down, we're prepared for that, those moments. Um, and so, you know, I think Azari has given us really good snaps. And, you know, if he's out there at corner more times, then it's probably just more plays we made by him. Um, and, you know, they do have some talented wideouts. And the Pierre Saulgate had a really good first half against us. Um, and, you know, it's important that we know where he is and do a good job with him. That's a Patrick Payton, um, probably not getting the sacks he went through in the season, but um, get, had nine batted balls, two in the last game. What has he done so well to, you know, even if he's not getting to the quarterback, impact, it, it, impacting the um, in the pass game? You know, Pat's really intelligent, and um, you know, just, you know, he plays to the throwing side hand a lot, you know, just on how we line him up, and you know, we're trying to get as many sacks and pressures with him as we can. He just has a really good sense of timing and pace of play. You know, you see some defensive linemen that just all they see is the six inches in front of them, which is important too. You know, Pat kind of sees through blockers and can anticipate throw lanes, can anticipate, and it helps that you know, obviously he's 6'5 with really long arms. Um, and, you know, he's got a great feel for football, and I think that shows up uh, on that. It was funny, early in the year he asked me what the record for most pass breakups for a defensive lineman or – uh, I didn't quite have the answer. Um, I just said, keep doing it, and I'll let you know at the end of the year. Anything else? Do you have the answer now or no? No, sir. <laughs> at the end of the year. Perfect. Thanks, Coach. Thank Thanks, guys. guys.